My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. Apocalypse, I said, why you want to show up now? Just when the heart of my life was getting good. I'll give you one more train. Walk on out of the door, yeah. Get your ass to getting where the getting is good. Good morrow, you Menadites. This is Aaron Odom from Trident Theater, bringing you another episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. I'm going to cut this part of the uh, show short today because I want to get right into the topic. We had a lot to talk about today. Joining me again is returning guest Brittany Chafee, who has some theater background but has been in New York for a number of years and goes to see just about every show she can when she's not being a full-time nanny. Brittany and I have known each other for several years now. She was on our episode, Can Seymour Be Hot? And she has her own theater horror story. So you can go back and listen to those. But I want to just jump right into the episode today, which is The Fantastics. Brittany, it is so fantastic to see you again. And actually, this is our first kind of face-to-face conversation since I came to New York last year and actually met you face-to-face. I know, it was so much fun. I'm so glad that it was able to work out for us to like meet up for a little bit. It was so fun. And meeting your family. Yeah, that was lovely. And I, I this was so fun because you gave us a suggestion on where to go for like an authentic New York bagel experience. What did I tell you? <laughs> I, I can't remember. It was one down in Hell's Kitchen. Oh, oh, I told you Hudson Bagel. Yes, Hudson Bagel. That's it. Yep, yep. I just ordered from there this morning. I'm not going to lie. I think I had an experience similar to what a lot of tourists experience when they go to Yellowstone. So you know, here I am in Wyoming, and it's like all the people are getting out, and they're like, I want to pet the furry cow. You're like, no, that one has, no, <laughs> sweetie, no. The bears all want to talk to me. <laughs> So we ordered and, and and I sat down and I got a, a table for everybody. And I had that experience of a woman sitting next to me and she's going, you know, this is not what I ordered. This is not what I ordered. And I told the guy I went up to and and, and the people in the table were like, well, you should just go and see what's going on. And she's like, I will. And she went up and yelled at the guy a little bit. And she came back and she said, he <laughs> says, this is what this order always has been. And this is what I order every single time. And it is not what I have ordered every single time. And I'm like, oh, God, don't touch the bear. <laughs> But at the same time, like, I want to hear everything. That's a great accent, too, by the way. (laughs) I'm experiencing New York nature. (laughs) That is hilarious. New York is very passionate about their bagels. Oh, absolutely. I can understand that. I mean, uh, I I try to tell people about it. They're like, isn't it weird? It's so crowded and everything. I'm like, it's, you know what? Here's the thing. Everybody there is trying to get someplace. So if you're not in somebody's way, you're going to be okay. Oh, yeah. It was the only time I ever saw anybody get upset in New York was uh, when somebody was just like looking at a map app on their phone. Like, I think I'm some guys just standing there's like, hey, get out of the way. And yep. that was it. I was like, eh, well, yep. fair enough. Yep. You're a roadblock. <laughs> it's it's the worst thing. Like, I feel you need a walking license just like you need a driving license. The other day, quick <laughs> rant, but I was walking down the street. And when you open a door or when you exit a building, you need to look both ways. You just need to look both ways. And the amount of people that don't, I'm walking a normal New York pace. I'm not speed walking, normal New York pace. And this woman comes out and, you know, I'm just like, oh, okay, go around her. Don't hit her, don't nothing. And she goes, "Ah, you're welcome. And I was like, (laughs) what am I supposed to say you're welcome to for not hitting you? (laughs) I was so livid. I was like, are you kidding me? You didn't have to move. I had to move out of my way to not hit you. But yet 
all because you couldn't just be like, oh, someone's coming right this second. Oh, I was so irritated. <laughs> I can't stand it. You, you need a walking license in New York, I swear. A couple classes would help. Maybe it was immediate gratitude for that on the fly lesson of how to find your way around somebody. You're welcome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I guess that's a good, it's a positive way of looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Brittany, I, I, I you know, I, you don't disappoint on your social media. I love that you get to go see every show and you see it many, many times. But yeah, I got to ask you this, Brittany. What is your deal with this Neil Diamond musical? <laughs> She's taking a drink. She, I almost got a spit take. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> not, <laughs> that was not planned. <laughs> At all. No. <laughs> oh, but, okay. So first well, off, how many times have you seen it? Fifteen. Ooh. That's not even record breaking. Okay. There's no. People that have been there several more, like more times than that. Fifteen. Oh yeah. Though. Fifteen. Just fifteen, guys. But so so what's what's your connection to it? Like, there's obvious. I mean, sure, it's probably it was probably a great show. But... Yes. Some but, people would say otherwise, but yes, it was. <laughs> it was. No, I grew up with Neil Diamond. You know, my yeah. grandma was, don't you dare make me cry on this, I swear. I will. <laughs> but my grandma was a humongous fan of his, went to concerts of his. So, you know, went to her children, to her grandchildren. So we all grew up with Neil Diamond. And I, my grandma was my bestest of bestest friends. Loved her. And so going to see that show... I was able to take my mom the first time. And my dad is a little, he's having trouble right now. He has been for a year or two, but he, he plays, he's always played the guitar and sung and writes his own music. So he sings at coffee shops and he hasn't been able to do that lately. Um, uh, we're not okay. he's ever going to be able to do that again. Oh, so boy. there was another like, oi with this show because Neil Diamond has Parkinson's. My dad does not have Parkinson's though, but oh, Neil Diamond okay. has Parkinson's. So he can't perform ever again. Yeah. So it's another like, oh, that that not only my grandma, but it's also like with my dad. So but every time I'd go see the show, I just felt closer to her. You yeah. Know? And it was another way of saying things are going to be OK with my dad. You know, yeah. it's positive show made me cry every time. But oh, it's so <laughs> good. Good thing on tour. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yeah. See, for me, that that would be Hank Williams. Oh, really? Yeah, he was one of my grandmother's favorite artists. There is that one musical out there called Lost Highway, and I did get to see it. And it wasn't, it, this was written like before this huge string of jukebox musicals came out. So it was a very loosely pieced together story, but it was just basically, let's take Hank Williams' greatest hits in chronological order and put them on stage. Oh, I don't know if I've ever heard of it. Was it good? It was okay. But it's the same thing. If you like Hank Williams music, you're yeah. going to love it. Yeah. And then I remember seeing something like, I think Tom Hiddleston played him in a, like a biopic or something like that. And it almost made me go, did I see Tom Hiddleston? And, <laughs> and obviously not, but it was still kind of cool. <laughs> but anyway, Brittany, you're still hanging out, going to shows in New York all the time. And it's amazing. So I thought of this topic as soon as I realized you were going to be on the show and just, I ate this up with a spoon. This thing, as soon as I started putting it on paper, I'm just like, oh, this is delicious. I can't, I can't get enough. Okay. I do have a question here in a little bit, but I'm going to start with this. This part always makes me so nervous. <laughs> no, 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 no. I always treat my guests with the utmost of care. You do. When Phantom of the Opera Closed its original Broadway run on April 16th, 2023, it became the longest-running production in Broadway history. Quote, since it opened on Broadway in January of 1988, Phantom has played almost 14,000 performances to audiences of over 20 million, grossing over $1.3 billion. An estimated 6,500 people have been employed in the production, including over 400 actors, and it takes a cast, orchestra, and crew of 125 to put on the show. End quote. How many times did you see that? Not, not as many, but, but mm -hmm. I, on Broadway, I've yeah. seen it, I want to say four or maybe five times i'd have to go back mm -hmm. and look but phantom's another one that mm -hmm. it was 
my grandparents took all our, their grandkids to go see it. You know, it was my first show, obviously on tour. Uh, okay. okay. Yep. 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 And so that one also, Michael Crawford, you know, the original, like Sarah Brightman, that was like the dream to sound like her. And I remember in college, <laughs> a, girlfriend, a girlfriend of mine was just like, I just can't stand her vibrato. It's just so immature. And I was like, how oh. dare you? Okay. Like, ugh, what? So I <laughs> love Sarah Brightman, love Michael Crawford, the OGs, you know, like the Phantom. Gosh, it's amazing, isn't it? And I will never, I'll never forget I passed because I was like, no, I have to save money at this time. So I did not go to the closing night, but I had a friend offer me a ticket. It was like $200. And he's like, no, you don't need to pay me. And I was just like, no, I would. But so I can't go. I just can't. I just oh. really need to save money right now. And yep. the next morning I was like, I hate my life. I hate my life. I hate everything about it. <laughs> oh, oh. I'll never forget. Like that's a big regret of mine. Big regret. Okay. See, yeah. I have I have mad respect for Phantom, but yeah. it you know it's just not my cup of tea. Like yep. it, you know, I I, I I I I go for different stuff, but I I listen to that and I go, I see how cool that show is, and I see yeah. how it has the fan base that it does. So not knocking it. I did have a friend who, when I first met them, they said I can't stand theater, and I'm like, well, I guess we can't be friends then, but. <laughs> <laughs> I said, why do you hate theaters? And, and they said, well, look, I had a friend take me to, we went to New York for something I was in and I had a friend who said, let's go see the show. And we went to see this show and I don't know. I just didn't follow it. It was about this guy like stalking this young girl and then a chandelier fell. And I'm like, oh my God, no wonder you don't like theater. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> but you know, whatever, that's fine. Here's what legendary director Hal Prince, who directed the Broadway production of Fan of the Opera, had to say about its longevity. Yes. I think the enduring appeal is because it's so romantic and because audiences escape into it. It has a world of its own. And whatever problems they have out there on the street and in their daily lives, they come in here and it's like a little kid tripping on a fairy tale or something. Only this is a slightly dangerous one. But the point is, I think that they escape from reality for a couple of hours and in a romantic world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty much. I, I, yeah. I mean, there is that whole faction of people who really truly believe that theater is meant solely for escapism. Yeah. Like the world is this really awful place and we have this place to go where we can just kind of find a world that is ideal to us for a couple hours mm -hmm. and just go, ah, but there are some pretty poignant messages, you know, as Horace would say, we are here to educate and entertain. Yeah, no, I agree. While those are impressive stats and sentiments, here's the question I have for you today. Okay, now get nervous. Okay. Do you know what the longest running off-Broadway production was? Oh, she's racking her brain. I just had a conversation. Can I have the first letter? T. T. Mm -hmm. is, is it the? Yes. Well, that's not <laughs> I want, I can't, I'm, ugh. Now here, I'll, I'll let you keep thinking about that. And, and I'm going to go ahead for my listeners. I should probably explain the difference between Broadway and off-Broadway. I mean, yeah. a lot of people probably know, but I think it helps to establish a baseline. So mainly, it has to do with money-making opportunity and seating capacity in the orchestra. Broadway theaters must meet these following conditions. Quote, in addition to having 500 seats or greater, they must be located in the theater district, just around Times Square in Midtown Manhattan, and in venues certified by the Broadway League, the trade association for the Broadway industry. Okay, so you got to have at least those three things, 500 seats or more, you have to be certified, and you have to be in a certain like little box on the map. Mm -hmm. But with the tendency for Broadway theaters to have more of a tourist draw, there is a potential to make a lot more money. Thus, larger productions are more feasible for Broadway as the probability for return on investments is greater. And as I've said many times before in this program, investors can be anyone from famous artists to politicians to extremely wealthy people who just want to have their name on something that will last forever and also create a passive income stream for many years to come. So yes. that's Broadway, right? Yes. In a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. Off-Broadway theaters can have no more than 499 seats in the house. And usually they're adjacent to the theater district in Manhattan, but they don't necessarily have to be. They also don't require any sort of certification. They can just be, but they also have to fight for their ticket sales every night in the vast shadow of the Broadway marketing and the draw. 
But it's also a place where shows can be tried in a Broadway adjacent market to see if a larger production can be launched to some success on the Great White Way. A great example of this is Hamilton. Yes. What was it? It was the the warehouse like or something like that. And uh the public. Oh, the public. That's it. It was at the public. Yeah. And then yeah. then they're like, uh duh, this is going to Broadway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so many moved to Broadway. Well, not yeah. so many. I I should right that right. one up, but a lot do, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I I had a friend in the off-Broadway production of Rock of Ages that ran in 2019. Oh, really? At uh, New World, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And while I never saw it, I did see production photos, and the yeah. scale of that production was pretty impressive, rivaling some of the things that I have seen on Broadway. And I think they yeah. just missed the mark of seating capacity by, like, 12 seats or something like that. Oh, really? Yeah, but it was at New World stages, so it was, like, it was designed to be an off-Broadway theater, like, None of them were more than 500. Yeah. In any case, I think they were hoping for a shot at Broadway. And then that whole dumb COVID thing happened. Yeah. 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 Dark times. Anyway. Dark, dark times. Yes. At any given time, there are approximately 85 off-Broadway theaters operating in Manhattan. Now, off-Broadway theaters will often show a mixture of different plays and talent. Often, audience goers might see big stars from Broadway, film, or TV who are just testing their metal in smaller markets, or they have a passion project they'd like to get off the ground. <laughs> there is a third tier to this whole thing, and that's off off Broadway. Yeah. Which is classically designated as any theater with 99 seats or less. Now, audiences yeah. can expect an incredible range of shows from classic plays and musicals to extremely avant garde or experimental works. Not necessarily something that can make it to Broadway, but it's not completely outside the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. So to put this in perspective for my listeners to see the kind of potential for an upward progression of how a show could go, regular listeners may remember my episode on Debbie Does Dallas, the musical, which premiered off off Broadway at the Crane Theater, which is now sadly closed. And, and that was part of the uh, New York Fringe Festival in 2001. And while the original production was not a musical, the show was reimagined as a musical in 2002 and played off Broadway at the Jane Street Theater with uh, Sherry Renee Scott in the lead role. Hey, <laughs> this is just after she got done with Aida. So oh. that's that's wow. that's landing Moby Dick. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a choice for her. Uh huh. Uh huh. Wow. And they were trying to see if there could be some impetus to get such a campy show to Broadway. It's happened before. I'm looking at you, Lacage. Yeah. Didn't exactly work. But that's kind of the structure, right? Now, uh, and I'm sure you've seen shows at every type of venue there is. Yeah. And yeah, yeah definitely. Like you go off off Broadway. If it, it feels like it might be taking a chance, something would be really good. Something might be like that was. A show. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but then I've seen some really off, off, off Broadway shows. And it's like, I walked away just, wow, that was. Yeah. I remember seeing one within the last year or so. It was a girl and she never faced us. Oh. She never once faced us. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, wow. Okay. I, I was, I walked out emotional. Like it was yeah. crazy. Yeah. It was yeah. really cool. But yeah, then and then you leave them and you're just like, okay, that's done. Great. I can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, about shows like you you just talked about, like it, it was so emotional, it was such a visceral experience, but you're like, yeah. that won't work in any other market. Like I have to be in a small, intimate setting with only no Definitely. more than 98 other people. And yeah. it this is how it works. Yep. You might be able to imagine it a little bigger, but it just, it, mm. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of people say with some shows that go from off, off to off, to to Broadway itself, a lot of times they just can't make it on Broadway. And some a lot of like um Here Lies Love, a lot of people are like, oh, if they opened right. off Broadway in a smaller venue, it, it would have just lasted years and years. But you know, unfortunately, sometimes Broadway just isn't that audience. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and right. uh, uh, there is a lot of reason why something stays off Broadway. I mean, Brittany, yeah. the last time you were on this show, we talked about Little Shop of Horrors. And it's still there. It's still there. And mm-hmm. it does well Crazy. because it is that kind of a small show. You mm-hmm. know, you put that on a bigger stage. I saw it on a national tour in a 3500 seat house. And yeah. 
and that? well, the uh, <laughs> the the puppet at the end broke, so you oh, know. No. Uh, the Audrey two was supposed to crane out over the, uh, the crowd and, and, you know, I'm going to go to kid you. Yeah. And yeah, that's uh, cool. after a 45 minute intermission, when they're like, we are experiencing technical difficulties, we got to the end of the show and it just stood there on stage, threatening everybody from the stage. And you're like, eh, it's, it's as effective, <laughs> but you know, some technician yeah. back there is like, eh, if it would have just worked. That would have been really cool though. If it was over the, I know. the one, uh, the one now, I mean, it just stays on stage. Yeah. So yeah. Which works. Yeah. No. Totally works. But it's no more than 500 seats. So yeah. that, perfect. It's a very small, intimate theater, but yeah. they have the casting rollover. It's great. Oh, God. I've talked about this so many times. I don't even know who it is right now. I know. But I, I remember um, Corbin Blue was there this year. He earlier. just left. Lynx, no, Jinx just left. Jinx Monsoon. Jinx. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes. And um, right now, I want to say Andrew. Oh my gosh, I forgot his last name. But he he won the um all my thoughts have just left my head. The Jimmy Award. <laughs> uh, all I can think of is Andrew Barbenheimer. And I know that that's not correct. <laughs> Why am I thinking Barbenheimer? Ugh. Um, I know I have listeners screaming at whatever they're listening on right now. Right? It's Andrew yeah. Barbenheimer. Yeah, I, I can't come up I'm with not... it either. Anyway. Yeah. And the girl from a uh, modern family. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Sarah Highland, Ariel Winter. Yes. Which one is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarah Highland. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I actually just saw uh, pictures today of the production that's, that either is going on right now or is coming up at the Guthrie in Minneapolis, uh-huh. and I was really impressed with this. Their Seymour is not hot, as we discussed. Okay. Uh, he's, he's pretty nerdy looking, and the Audrey is actually a, a plus size actor. Really? And I'm like, Yes, please. Let's do it. He's just in love with the glam of this girl who's in his life. And the pictures of them seeing suddenly Seymour, I was just like, yep. Aww. Yep. That's lovely. I love it. Anyway, that's great. Yeah. Listeners, if you haven't listened to that episode that Brittany and I did, uh, go back and listen to that. It's fantastic. Yes. So anyway, here we are off Broadway. And that leads me back to the original question. I think you might have it. What is the longest running show off Broadway? What What was the show that Aaron Carter was in? And I don't oh think that's right, God. but I think, do you know what show I'm talking about? I'm going to look it up. I try not to look anything up. I, did, I, I didn't look anything <laughs> up. But I, I want to say it was that one, but I feel like I'm wrong. You are right. You are right. <gasps> no. It is the show that Aaron Carter was in, which is called... Wait, wait, wait. wait. What's the show? The Fantastics. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh great. Now my hair is all going even crazier. Oh. Yes, I was right. What happened? Did you go see it? I didn't. No. No. No, I've never seen it. Do you know the show? A little bit. Okay. Well, lucky for you, we're doing a crash course on the Fantastics today. Oh my gosh! (laughs) It's like last time. Okay. (laughs) Here I thought we're talking about Neil Diamond. No, we're talking about Phantom. No, we're talking about the Fantastics. Okay, let's do it. Yay! (laughs) So if my listeners, if you haven't heard of it, I'm not entirely surprised. And that's frankly for a number of reasons, which we'll get into later. And I'll give the stats later on the longest running situation off Broadway. And you're just going to be kind of staggered, I promise you. But first, I want to talk about the history of the product. Dramatist Edmund Rostand, who most theater nerds will know as the playwright of Cyrano de Bergerac, wrote a play in 19, in 1894 called Le Romanesque, which was meant to be something of a tongue-in-cheek parody of Romeo and Juliet, particularly the concept of the enduring love of the star-crossed lovers. Nice. I had that whole episode on Shakespeare-adapted Romeo and Juliet. I, I had Ethan on it for the first half, and I told him the story of it. And at that time, yeah. as a 13-year-old kid, he's like, this is making me physically ill to think about these two kids, like, falling in love at a party and then just continuing the feud by fueling their love. And mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. 13 year old that's typical i get it yeah after a successful run at the comedy francaise in the 1890s playwright julia constance fletcher saw it and writing under the pen name george fleming because you can't get a good play from a woman in the in 1900 yeah she adapted le romanesque into english changing the name to the fantastics with the cks ending based upon a british spelling of the word as it was used in one point in the play 
Fletcher slash Fleming thought that further emphasized the idea of subversion of the, quote, correct way to do things. Okay. Throw Maybe. it in the face. Here's my... Mm -hmm. Fletcher also kept the satirizing of the concept of romantic love as being too idyllic, particularly in a world that had moved on from romantic sentiments and a theater world, which at that time had just passed the realist movement. So they're like, yeah, this whole enduring love kind of thing is just kind of phony. And plus, we already tried realism. We're going into some weird stuff now. So let's take it a page <laughs> at a time here. So moving ahead in the timeline a bit, the 1950s, was a time that people seem to think was all about prosperity and return to traditional values following victory in World War II. But by the end of the 1950s, a lot of these values were being questioned and criticized, such as white flight, I mean, that mass migration of white people out of the cities uh, into the suburbs to escape urban problems, read black people. They were also challenging organized religion and the nuclear family. Quote, Young Americans were becoming obsessed with individuality, with rebellion, with freedom, with art as a means to criticize social and political structures, and the most disconcerting of all, with modern jazz. <gasps> I know. No. <laughs> Gosh. That's horrible. Oh, no. <laughs> that, that might be actually my favorite derogatory slang term for marijuana is jazz cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that one no. before. Jazz cabbage? Jazz cabbage. Oh. You know, I mean, you know, reefer madness was a thing, but my God, when that jazz came in, ugh, oh. gets the kids oh. dancing and swinging their hips and ugh. the audacity they have. Yeah. And I started to think about that. Like, my breakout role in high school was the James Dean role in Rebel Without a Cause. Oh, nice role. Yeah. And I went, well, I guess I got to see it now. And I just couldn't figure it out. <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with these kids? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But at the same time, it's like, so we don't all fit into a white picket fence house, two bed, three bath, other other way around uh and it yeah wait wait what? <laughs> we have three bathrooms and only two bedrooms somebody sleeps in the bathroom <laughs> so it's at this time writer tom jones not that tom jones not the um, it's not unusual no he's yeah. often had to explain that in interviews no i'm not that guy so tom jones was missing his composer partner harvey schmidt who was serving overseas in the korean war so Tom Jones found something of a replacement in a composer in J. Donald Robb, and the pair sought to pierce the facade of 1950s romance by creating a new musical. Jones and Robb premiered their project titled Joy Comes to Dead Horse. It was, suppo it was kind of a, a Western in which they made fun of the Romeo and Juliet mythos. <laughs> Joy Comes to Dead Horse. I think that's supposed to be the name of a town. I was going to say, yeah, okay, it's the name of a town. Cool. Yeah. So they premiered Joy Comes to Dead Horse at the University of New Mexico in 1956. It's set in Texas with a strong Western theme. The product didn't quite turn out how the pair intended. Quote, it was an uneasy mix of Our Town, Finian's Rainbow, Zorro, and various Shakespearean comedies. The collaborators decided it was an unsalvageable mess and parted company. <laughs> Sounds like a lot. I'm kind of intrigued, though. I'm not going to lie. Zorro's in there and, you know, the wet. I don't know. I wanted to see just what a train wreck it was. <laughs> yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it sounds very interesting. But is joy a person or is joy joy? I think it's um, a concept of joy. Concept it's the concept of, of, oh, wow, love came to these two people whose families were feuding and, and wow. they overcame it. And it just, mm, no. Nah. Yeah. It was a play, though, or a musical? It was a musical, yeah. It was a musical, okay. okay. Uh huh. But the idea stayed on Jones's mind for the next few years. Mm -hmm. West Side Story premiered in 1957, a respectful adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Yes. And while Off Broadway hadn't really even been an institution at that point for a decade, at that time it was really seen as a place to stage edgier materials that could challenge social norms a little more aggressively. Plus, by 1959, 
The beat movement had inspired a lot of disdain for that which was, quote, shallow and less than authentic, man. The beat music? You know, like beat poetry, like beatniks and, you know, oh. like, you know, oh, they okay. They'd all sit in coffee houses and smoke their cigarettes and talk about the man and all that, you know, <laughs> round sunglasses and everybody's got yeah. turtlenecks and berets on. Yeah. Anyway. Exactly. Yeah. By 1959, Schmidt had returned from overseas and Jones had been working with him to develop the project he originally sought to create, wanting to make it a musical in a big flashy style of a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. Mm but it still wasn't quite working out. And I can see like the idea, like you're trying to use their style against them, you know? Mm -hmm. I I mean, much in the same way, like Book of Mormon does that, you know, where it it is a big, huge, flashy musical and it's talking about some really dark things (laughs) that probably need to be talked about. Director Charles Word Baker, that was his nickname, Word. and. Word Baker, Word Baker. Wow. Word Baker was given the opportunity to present a night of three one acts at Barnard College's Minor Latham Theater in Uptown Manhattan. And he asked Jones and Schmidt to condense Joy Comes to Dead Horse into a minimalistic one act version. This forced Jones and Schmidt to make several essential changes. They cast off the idea of making a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, which gave them the bandwidth to focus specifically on telling the story with traditional storytelling and musical elements instead of, okay, how how many pieces can we get in the orchestra? Didn't care about that. Let's just focus on what we're here to do. This also forced them to reject setting the play in Texas, allowing them a lot more freedom with their characters. You know, so you don't have to have a sheriff and, you know, yeah. a, a rich old guy who owns the mine or something like that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Why did they have a set in Texas? Did you, did you say I that? have no idea. I think oh, it was, okay. you know, it probably has to do a lot with the popularity of Westerns at the time. That's a good point. If they're just yeah. flouting, you know, using everything in, in, in front of them as a means to make fun of it. That makes sense to me, but I never yeah. find out, I never found out why it was specifically like, let's set in Texas. It's just random thing, but okay, yeah. So they got rid of Texas. Uh-huh. Okay. The product they came up with told the story of a Commedia troupe playing a story of two neighbors, one with a son, one with a daughter, of approximately the same age. The men had an impenetrable stone wall dividing their properties, and in something of a prank to hook up their two kids... They invented a feud between themselves that their children believed with utter sincerity and naivety. So therefore, they're going to flout their parents and fall in love with each other, which is what the two dads wanted. Oh, so they they just joked, they pretended to yep. have the stone wall be a, oh. Yeah. Wow. Here you got the stone wall thing, which is, you know, Pyramus and Thisbe from Midsummer Night's Dream. So they're bringing the Shakespearean comedy elements into it. it, it really clever. That is clever. Sorry. Uh-huh. That took me yep. back. Nice. So the two men hire a, air quotes, villain, uh-huh. uh, an actor named El Gallo, translated as the rooster, who Jones and Schmidt had named after a famous gypsy bullfighter. So Okay. <laughs> just El Gallo, he's mysterious. He's got the Spanish flair, you know. And El Gallo is also strangely the narrator of the whole show too. Oh. So there, there's your our town where you're, the stage manager is actually part um, of the show, but he's also telling you the story at the same time. I'm like, ah, okay, I get and that. that okay, that was an incredibly popular play too. Blech. I hate it. It's but, about anyway. to open up again. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> El Gallo is to stage something of an abduction of the girl named Louisa so that the boy named Matt will come to her defense and rescue her, which should prove his ultimate love for her. <laughs> I'm, I keep going. I'm so intrigued. Right? I, I, I've never I, heard this yeah. story before. I'm, so, yeah. I'm horrible. I know. While Schmidt had wanted to make some big band jazz numbers in the earlier versions, uh, the one-act version kept some of those jazz themes, but he wrote the score to be played entirely by a piano, a small drum set, and a full-sized harp. Yeah. So you're going to see a one-act musical, and that's the only music you hear. And I actually listened to the whole soundtrack while I was writing this the other day, and it is. It's all piano. 
Yeah. Only piano. So it's like you're going to a high school musical, but it's like, so what? Exactly. So what? Do yeah. we need an oboe? No. Do we need a trumpet? Probably not. Let's just tell this story. Yeah. Bare bones, do it. And for this one act presentation, they kept the name The Fantastics, CKS, in much the same way Fletcher Fleming meant for it to be intended. Quote, <laughs> There was no direct English translation of that idea of romantic adventurousness in Le Romanesques, but Fleming's consciously whimsical misspelling of an approximate English equivalent seemed to convey exactly that sense of rebelliousness the musical's authors were looking for, a hint of outrageousness and subversiveness. By just having it misspelled. <laughs> 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 and again, and Schmidt, he said, uh, he was also a graphic designer, I guess. And he said, it just looks better on the poster. <laughs> it, it, the poster was great. Right? I mean, there's, there's no getting around that. The It looks great. I yeah. don't know why. It just yeah. looks. And every yeah. time I've seen it, it looks like it's written in like a uh, paintbrush. So yeah. it's just, it, it, it yeah. just seems like it it's written hastily and flashy and big and it just says exactly what you're coming to expect from this show. There's not a lot yeah. of flash, but it's a huge, big story, and you're going to have some big feelings about it. Yeah. So this version of the play is basically now what we know as the first act of the current full-length version. Okay? The, oh, the okay. father, The father's feuding, coming up with the thing to get their kids together, and the boy coming to rescue the girl from the abductor. Director Word Baker appreciated the artistic rebelliousness of the play, but also thought that the play wasn't entirely complete. Quote, it almost made you puke. Lots of things were changed. It was our trial run. We made all of our mistakes at Barnard. Oh, okay then. But, you didn't but, <laughs> hey, wow. Well, I mean, when he said it almost <laughs> made you puke, it was that very saccharine boy meets girl. Their love is bigger oh. than anything, you know. Uh, and and at the end of it, they're like, yeah, we didn't really actually flout anything. We wrote exactly what the time wanted us to write. This cute little love story that didn't require a lot of big flashy set pieces. Yeah. But that didn't stop producer Lori Noto. He saw this version, and while he agreed that it wasn't complete, offered the trio to get a full-length version for a run off-Broadway, which he would produce. So Jones and Schmidt went back to the drawing board. Schmidt wrote an overture, and the pair scrapped two songs and included a new one in Act 1, It Depends on What You Pay, and we'll talk about that song later, and they would have to completely come up with an Act 2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so did they, in the Act 1 with Wordbaker, did they tell the whole story in Act 1, or did they cut it? Like, did they literally just do act one of their show? I think that was what was not working is that the story wasn't complete. They were like, yeah, we're going to uh, make fun of all of these themes in, in current society. And they're like, no, you just told exactly the same kind of story that people are looking for right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. I mean, it would be like if on a soap opera, everybody found out somebody was pregnant and they were shocked. Well, that's what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. If they find if they went to somebody and they went, "My gosh, Beverly's pregnant," and he goes, "Oh, well, yeah, you didn't see that coming." <laughs> so now they have to act. They have to finish their story. Now they have to finish their story. Yeah. While Act 1 more often satirizes the idealized teenage love, new themes get introduced that further flesh out Act 2. The play now began to focus on the emotional catalysts and subsequent realities of two different kinds of love. Romantic love between two partners and the types of love expressed between parents and children. Jones has also stated that the play seems to take on themes of vegetation and harvest, hence probably why the play often reports that it's taking place in September when the harvest is getting started. Okay. The two acts are often referred to as looking at the two types of love in first in the moonlight in act two, or I'm sorry, which would be act one. And then act two is in the sunlight. Interesting. So <laughs> I tried, I'm, I tried to figure out how I was going to say this. This is like the scenario when you go to a club and it's dark 
and the music's pounding and there's lights kind of flashing, but you meet somebody, they catch your eye and oh, they smell good and they look cute and you go dancing. And, you know, there might be that moment where you go home and get a little intimate. And then the morning after, after the fun has happened and then they wake up <laughs> and yeah. the cologne and perfume is worn off and the makeup's not there anymore and the hair is all frizzled and you have to see this person in their reality for what they are. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's a great way of putting it though. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's good. <laughs> there, I think there was a, a line in it that was great uh, where uh, we have to be burned and burnished by love mm -hmm. where uh, in some cases we have to have that ideal, Oh, the, they're hanging the moon for me kind of love taken down but mm -hmm. in that you have to kind of polish it and work at it to make it lasting yeah now while matt and louisa end up together at the end of act one act two begins with the characters resuming the exact positions they held at the end of act one when the curtain dropped matt soon realizes that the love he fought for might not actually be 1000 percent what he's looking for and while he appreciates what he has quote like Kerouac. Matt believes he can only find answers out there in the world. But though Kerouac only crossed America, Matt literally goes around the world. Oh. Uh-huh. And Louisa stays behind. So Okay. We're, we're not just going to Texas. We're going everywhere. Okay. We're going everywhere. <laughs> okay. The fathers also have a moment of lament in that they find out that they both appreciate growing vegetable gardens and share a song called Plant a Radish during which the fathers face the realities of raising children in that you never know quite how they'll turn out despite your best efforts. You as a mm. nanny are probably pretty close to that. <laughs> At one point, one father sings, plant a radish, get a radish. Never any doubt. That's why I love vegetables. You know what you're about. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> That's a good line. So don't have children. Plant a garden. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez. Now, in the end, everyone has quite the existential journey and realizes that there's some more to a drive or a feeling than just the positive elements of it. Sometimes success in life requires struggle. Happiness doesn't always last. It must be worked for through struggle. And I just, I, you know, they're like, you know, this this happiness that you think you can just achieve by thinking it, it that that's so flimsy. Yeah. <laughs> And actually came out to the end and said the thing that they wanted to say. <laughs> Which what 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 was that? Well, I mean that that whole idea of the romantic uh, love in the fifties of you know I'm just going to meet a girl and we're going to have two point five kids and everything's going to be great. Yeah, you know we're never going to fight about the taxes or how much you're spending on butter or you know yeah because it's love yeah <laughs> because it's love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of reminiscent of Into the Woods, where you know the first act is all the fairy tales going through what they do and everybody getting exactly what they want, and yeah. then the second act is so what happens after happily ever after? Yeah, exactly. Are they okay? Are they really happy? Mm. <laughs> you know, that's a good so, point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, for the original Off Broadway production, the cast had eight members, incredibly minimalistic set pieces that just basically implied setting, and there were really no huge spectacle pieces. One metaphor I read in an article was just beautiful. The audience isn't there to get a huge, flashy Broadway piece. The audience was meant to listen to something of a campfire story told by storytellers with the stage lights providing the light from the campfire. That's nice. Isn't that nice? I was like, oh, that's really yeah, nice. That's exactly, yeah. Tell us a story, and that's what you get. And that's why things work so well off Broadway sometimes. Yes, exactly. That's, exactly. That's a great way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Now, the play struggled to find a following at first. When mm -hmm. previews began on April 23rd, 1960, and officially opened on May 3rd of that year, reviews were somewhat mixed. While some of the reviewers were expecting a little more, others were thrilled by the play's challenging of classical norms with easy-to-swallow storytelling devices, and still the production struggled to maintain attendance. Quote, a few celebrities started showing up at performances, and word of mouth began to spread, even though some nights the cast of eight still outnumbered the audience. Oh. Mm. 
that has to be rough as an actor. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Oy. I mean, I've done those shows where you invite a whole bunch of people, you tell them and, and you get, get out there and you're like, well, I'm glad the technicians showed up. Oh, geez. They're the crowd. <laughs> God, I can't imagine. Oh yeah. No. Early into its run, the company was given an offer to run the show for a one week engagement at a theater in East Hampton, New York during the summer. This would be when a lot of celebrities and Manhattan elite would be vacationing and they needed something to do in the evening. Mm-hmm. Brittany, to say that the show went viral from there would be almost inadequate. From there? That, that's where yeah. really? wow. The show returned to Manhattan during an actor's equity strike, so several Broadway productions had been shut down. So most people, it, it was kind of like the celebrities in the Hamptons who saw it were kind of hipsters, and they're like, they saw it mm-hmm. before it was cool, and they started telling everybody about it afterwards. Yeah. Most people who wouldn't even dream of going to an off-Broadway production now had little choice, and they all had heard wonderful things about the Fantastics. So during this Broadway, uh, the equity strike, they all went to see the Fantastics. So that's where the cult started. Because uh-huh. it has a cult, a cult like a, what's that word? Cult audience. Is that is yeah. the right word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. definitely has mm-hmm. that cult audience. Wow. Mm-hmm. People like Anne Bancroft, Bob Fosse, Aaliyah Kazan and Jerome Robbins fell in love with the show. Celebrities began making phone campaigns to keep the show alive and have seats filled. The cast album had been recorded and was now available for sale all over the country. Everybody was talking about the Fantastics. And the rest, as they say, is history. Several TV and film adaptations have been released and the production stayed off-Broadway for decades. So here are the stats that I promised earlier, and I didn't, I, I, and I didn't say, but Phantom uh, ran for 35 years, but here yeah. are the stats for the Fantastics. Here we go. Quote, in October 1980, that's 20 years, the original production sold its millionth ticket. To date, there have been more than 400 foreign productions in 69 countries and more than 12,000 productions in the U.S. in more than 2,000 cities and all 50 states, as well as 15 national tours. And I think this is a quote from 2017, so there's probably been more since then. One production played in San Francisco for six years, one in Los Angeles ran four years, and one in Denver ran five years. The Fantastics eventually ran, here we go, big numbers, 17,162 performances at the Sullivan Street Theater or Sullivan Street Playhouse before closing in January 2002. After an almost 42 year run, twice as long as Cats, more than twice as long as Cats, becoming the longest running show in American history and the longest running musical in the world. <laughs> She's applauding. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. But that- that's crazy. I know. That's crazy. But see, that's just the thing we were talking about. Can you imagine if at some point that went to Broadway? It would have. Like, well, I don't know. I don't want to talk out of turn, but it would have flopped, I would think. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe it was great. Would have been great. It could have been. But, you know, you could just see somebody going, well, we have to get this to 2,500 people each performance. Uh, yeah. Let's add some more orchestra. Uh, let's yeah. add some bigger set pieces. And I think that would just destroy the charm of that show. Yeah. yeah. Right? 42 years. That's a great story, though. Well, I'm not done yet. Okay. Of course, I'm sure you can imagine, given the watered-down explanation I gave, how this show easily captures the imaginations of children and adults alike. Yeah. I mean, you could get one person out there who can just do a bunch of voices and kids are going to love it if as long as the story is told well and that willing suspension of disbelief that imagination is happening and they're just like wow and adults they're hearing this great story about love and everything but also has a very poignant message by the end that they go yep i've been through that with my kids yep mm-hmm. i get it you know that kind of stuff mm-hmm. now while the list of stats and characteristics is impressive you might have noticed that it's not done nearly as often today in 2024. This is just 22 years later. And while it is a staple of the American theater, there are some problematic elements that prevent further revivals today. Shocking. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, 
I, here I am in Sheridan, Wyoming, and I have people who will decide whether or not they're going to go to a show if they find out there is an F word in it. Oh, wow. Really? Yep. We have difficulty even suggesting. I, I've heard it in other places in the state. They have difficulty suggesting, well, we could do damn Yankees. And and like, no, it's a classic baseball show and it's got some fun songs and everything. And you got a great part for a female lead and everything. It's or two female leads. It's really fun. Uh, it is about mm, selling your soul to Satan, but they wow. can't get past. They can't get past that word. Damn. I was going to say, is it because damn's the word? Yep. Wow. Yeah. Boy, that really <laughs> narrows things so... down, doesn't it? My goodness gracious. Right? <laughs> but uh, I have to use some uncomfortable language to talk about the first problem. While it's not the only song in the current canon that uses the word, the song, it depends on what you pay, uses the word rape almost an obscene amount of times. The song is the depiction of the father's agreement with El Gallo on how he will concoct the abduction of Luisa. However, El Gallo states that the traditional term for abduction is the word rape, but in a more literary sense, like uh, as in the rape of the lock, in which locks of hair are stolen from a fair damsel or something like that. No sexual assault there, but there are another story. Okay, yeah. Then throughout the song... He suggests many other types of abductions he could do, referring to them all as rapes, stating his preference for the word in this lyric. Now, I know you prefer abduction, but the proper word is rape. It's short and more businesslike. Oh, okay. I have a reason to use this incredibly uncomfortable word. Ah. Uh. <laughs> It's more bi- it's more business like. It's it's business like. I'm sorry. Then the, that is the line. It doesn't have more. It's just it, it's short and business like. Wow. Now, of course, it's almost impossible to hold any show written in the distant past to be able to be held to modern standards. Yeah. However, around 1990, the term became more connected with sexual assault, and therefore was a difficult and it, it was difficult and would often trigger negative emotional response in audiences. Obviously, mm-hmm. I mean, I was mm-hmm. just talking with uh, about this with Andrea, the woman who walks beside me, and I said, "Can you b- imagine?" She's like, "Nope." I, I mean, she was getting uncomfortable with me even saying the word around her. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm just describing this uh, song. And she's like, I know, but. We're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. When you said kids would go to the show too. And then you said that part. I'm just like, oh, how are kids, how are parents? I would be, no, 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 no. Yep. Yep. Get up. We're going. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they changed it. Uh-huh. The night. Well, kind of. Uh-huh. Okay. Tom Jones has said in interviews that he's done his best to add rewrites, but original producer Lori Noto did not want to change the original production during its run, claiming that he bought the product he bought and didn't want to change anything. Okay. Even when your audience is saying, this is making us uncomfortable. Nope. <laughs> did, was he worried that it would be less successful? I have no idea. I have no idea. I will say I listened to that song the other day and it moves. It's a fun little tune despite the negative uh, stuff, but it's a well-written tune. So here's, here's the thing. After it closed on uh, off Broadway in 2002, many would take up Jones on his changes. On one hand, he actually wrote a version of the song in which all of the uses of the word were replaced with the word abduction, but it didn't quite match the tempo of the song. So it kind of, took away from it he also wrote a song simply called abductions to completely replace it depends on what you pay oh but i hate this many directors and producers liked the original song so much just the sound and the feel of it and they kept the original intact claiming that that was the original intent of the play i (laughs) like i can understand i mean i'm now i'm definitely gonna have to listen to the song unfortunately but you know when a tune has such a, a has a good tune and it carries and everything like you can't that of one syllable to three syllables yeah you need someone to do some work with that because that's not that's how you you can't just switch them out and if you're gonna have someone come in and rewrite an entire song and change the lyrics not the tune but also the tune i mean you're gonna have to have someone really good coming in so i guess i kind of understand their point but at the same time it's like no if you want the show to be well, yeah. I guess it still was a success. So, ah. Yeah. And oh. I think uh, when it's produced, you can actually eliminate that song now. Like, you, you, okay. you, you just don't even have to do it. 
but there, yeah. But people uh, still do. It, it, people still do it. And if you don't do it, you don't understand that the fathers have hired El Gallo to abduct Luisa. So he just comes out of nowhere and you're like, yeah. okay. You had no idea that this had anything to do with the fathers at all. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay. Well, enough of that talk. Um, another precarious element of the original production, Brittany, mm -hmm. is one of the troop of out of work air quotes actors that El Gallo hires to assist him with the abduction. While it can be seen that most of these actors are caricatures of old school villains or henchmen at best, mm -hmm. one of them held to today's standards can be seen as immensely offensive. This character dresses in what is supposed to be traditional Native American gear, including feathers and war paint, and sometimes a full war bonnet. Plus, the character is named the Mute and never speaks a word. When you say war paint and a war bonnet? Mm hmm I'm talking about the feathered headdress all the way okay. down the back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Usually played by a white actor. Of course. <laughs> But, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of, I feel like you probably didn't need to tell me that because I, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. In June 2017, during a production of the Fantastics at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, a group of high school students walked out of a production gaining national media attention. To make matters worse, the students that were admitted were Native American students. And they were admitted for free as a college admissions push to show students what college life would be like and what they could look forward to. I think due to an unfortunate lack of foresight, the invited students were all visiting during the university's Native American Summer Institute program. <laughs> it needs gobsmacked, hands over the mouth. Here, I, uh, continuing on. This program oh. was intended to encourage Native students to apply to the university. And I think it had the opposite effect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I mean, look, wow. I, I can just see so much miscommunication happening in that, like, the theater department goes, this is just a classic piece of theater. We're going to do it. Uh, you know, we know that there's some some difficult stuff and everything. And then people in admissions going, hey, is the theater program putting on a play? Perfect. We'll just send the yeah. kids to go see it because it's something that they'll be yeah. able to do when they get here. Not, Not really, really knowing really. what's going on. Oh. And can I ask, uh -huh. you might have said this, but the actor who plays, and what was the name of the? The Mute. The mute. Okay. Doesn't even speak. You <laughs> think he didn't talk or that he was mute, but I didn't know that was his name. That's so, his name. Great. Perfect. So the mute played by a white man. Was that in the casting, like had to be played by a white man or was it just because that's, they get everything? I, th I think it, it didn't specify that it was supposed to be a Native American. I think, you know, okay. they're just, it, it, it's also kind of a flouting of that traditional 50s, like, this is kind of a villain character, because we're, we talked about the Old West. I think it was actually a remnant of uh, Joy Comes to Dead Horse, in which one of the villains, oh, I hate to say it, uh, I think they called him a half-breed Apache. Oh, geez. <sighs> Oh boy, we're going way back, aren't we? Ugh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you'd have that. You've, you you'd have you'd yeah. have guys playing like stereotypical Italians or Irishmen with any kind of negative connotation there, and they're like, "Well, uh, you can't trust the Irish." And uh, okay. God, Ooh wee! All right, those poor kids. Oh, oh man, you imagine going yeah. home and telling their families like, "Oh yeah, I checked out this college of theater group." Woo. Yeah, and, and it's not like Wyoming doesn't have a large population of Native Americans That's, like we do. Then, we have... new side, then this production in Wyoming, I was just like, oh no, here we go. <laughs> oh, and, man. and I'm sure so many fingers were pointed like, you didn't tell us those kids were coming. And the admissions people are like, you didn't tell this, this had an offensive Native American character. <laughs> Jeez Louise. <laughs> I'm learning so much right now about this show. Uh-huh. So, 
In the wake of several national news outlets breaking stories on the incident, the cast and crew of the production issued a statement which had this to say. Um, with historical productions, we see a, air quotes, point in time, which is different from the one in which we live. We see portrayals of characters that are painful to watch as 21st century audiences. The challenge, then, in producing historical works is to help audiences understand the context and or story for the play without taking undue or illegal liberties with the script. Oh. We're bound by law. I mean, we we basically have to, guys. Like, <laughs> wow. Were they, were they thinking that was helpful? It probably was, though, helpful for them. I don't uh, know. What year was that released? 2017. 2017? 2017? They said that? Seven years ago. I thought that, that was in the 90s that you were talking. First. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> June 2017. Jiminy Christmas. Uh, one blogger I read, an Asian American writer who could sympathize with ethnicities being marginalized in popular media, suggested that in its current form, perhaps companies should just not produce the Fantastics, regardless of the other elements that make the play truly enjoyable. Which is so sad. Well, oh, it's not, but wow. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is a play that is a very popular show in like community and regional theaters. It's Lend Me a Tenor by Ken Ludwig. Do you know this one? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very funny farce, mistaken identities, people running yeah. in and out of doors and rooms and everything. Slapstick, right? Yeah. It all centers around an opera company in the Great Depression. They're launching a, a production of Otello, which is going to be a make or break thing. So they hire this great tenor to come play the lead role. Mm -hmm. But as you may be aware, Otello is Shakespeare's Othello. And they usually cast a white guy to play the the Othello and smear his face in black makeup. Yeah. And they've been doing that for years and they're still doing it. And I went, this is very, very simple. In my very limited knowledge of opera, I did one opera in college, The Magic Flute, in which one of the main oh. characters is Papageno, who is a bird man. Well, actually, he's more like a bird catcher, but his character, his costume looks more like a bird. It's got feathers, and sometimes I've even seen it with a beak on his face. So yeah. the funny thing about Lend Me a Tenor is it, they actually wrote it into a musical. In the non-musical, you have two guys running around in the Otello makeup. In the musical, you have three guys. And I'm like, guys, guys, just change the opera to the magic flute. And then you have three people running around in bird costumes. That's it. It's that's better. it that's <laughs> yeah. it there so you go. how do you how do you fix this problem in the fantastics you don't make him a native american you make him some other type of character a yeah. mute doesn't have to be native american he just doesn't have to talk was it was it part of the story the fact that he was native american like that's yeah. i guess what's throwing me or was it for pure like just enjoyment or, or like, like you said, of the time, you know, they made certain people out to be villains. Was that just, that was the reason why he was Native American? Well, in 1960, you know, like I said, they're oh. flouting all of these ideas of genre and, and everything. So they're using elements of that genre to make fun of the genre. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a comedian uh, I heard in one of his acts saying, like, in the old days, it's not unusual for half of your kids to get stole by the Apaches or something like that out in the, out on the old frontier. And I'm like, yeah, that's what people thought. That's and that was the image on TV. You know, yeah. I mean, how many times did that happen in Bonanza or Rawhide? <laughs> you know? Yeah. All the great Westerns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, who was it? Iron Eyes Cody, the great American uh, Native American actor, actually turned out to just be some Italian dude. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because he just had darker skin. Yeah. Yeah. He's the guy in that littering ad from the 70s where uh, a Native American is like walking on the beach or something and mm -hmm. all kinds of garbage is at his feet and the tear rolls down his face. That's not a Native American. It's an Italian dude who spent his entire life convincing people he was that. Wow. Yep. So they really could have just changed. You could have just changed it. You like, could have just changed it. Point? Just just have a little guy in like oversized clothes. Because it's a classic? 
I I don't know. And yes. And well, because for its 42 year run off Broadway, Lori Noda said no changes. And so that's just how it's known. Wow. That's wild. Uh huh. I mean, and for it to still be playing in 2024. Yeah. I get, I, I do understand where people don't want to change things. I like yeah. the whole Disneyland Tiana ride, you know? Yeah. Fine. Yeah. You know, like I understand, I can understand people's logic when it comes to like, but it's a classic. Okay, fine. Then let it be a classic and let it stay there. You mm-hmm. don't need to redo it now. Let it sit on the bookshelf if you want it to be a classic. That's fine. Yeah. But yeah. If, yeah. if you're going to redo it or if you're going to perform that classic now, mm-hmm. You, and you want the audience to not be uncomfortable. You want the audience to enjoy it. You don't want to offend people. You are going to have to make changes. And I don't understand mm-hmm. why in 2024 you wouldn't. Yeah. I think Tom Jones in that interview is like, I'm done rewriting the Fantastics. I've rewritten it so many times. I, and, and yeah. I, God, I don't even know if he's alive anymore, but at the same time, like he just goes, look, I can't make a play that works for everybody. And I get that. It also it almost makes me think of like high school uh, English classes, you know, telling people that we're going to read Huck Finn and you might be triggered by some of the things you're going to read where I just go. Can you just kind of maybe tell people what this era in literature was about and tell them there is this really popular novel, but now has things that, you know, might be offensive for people. So we're not going to read it. Instead, we'll read, you know, I don't know, Nathaniel Hawthorne or something like that. Yeah, I never read that one. Yeah, that one wasn't on our list. I read Huck and Finn. I think well, no, I watched the movie. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, you know, his friend, his friend Jim, is referred to as N word Jim through the entire thing, and it's written, it's printed out. That's his name, and, and yeah. Uh, so it's it, it's sensitive material. But they're like, but we're still going to read it so you can understand what's going on in this time frame. And like, nah. We, uh, you know, that's that would be in the theater world if a minstrel show was incredibly popular and we kept doing it because it was important to theater history. I acknowledge its place in theater history. I don't want to see people in blackface trying to sing like Louis Armstrong. I don't. (laughs) No, no. Yeah, I think that that's that's a great way of putting it. Like minstrel shows were classics, you know. If one came out now and there was blackface, I'd be like, what? What? Uh, no, 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 no. I think that's a great way of like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no, geez, Louise. Yeah. But anyway, oh, it's Brittany. That's my story of the Fantastics. Wow. Well, good job. That was great. I love that. <laughs> 40, 42 years. 42 years of run. I mean, and when somebody tried to tell me that they uh, like they got it wrong, they said it was the longest running musical on Broadway. I'm like, nope, no. yeah. nope. It was Phantom, and then before that, I think it was 42nd Street, or no, it was Cats. Yeah, and then, and then before Cats, it was 42nd, 42nd Street, and yeah. yeah. But geez, I I still love that idea of it focused on the essential storytelling elements, and that was its charm. Mm-hmm. It just has these two things now that I'm sorry, in today's world, we we can't do that. And I don't think it's, you know, unless it gets rewritten or comes out of public domain for to a point where we can just change what we want. Mm-hmm. Uh, nope, it's going to stay that relic. Yep. Yep. And I was so intrigued. And then at the end, you said those two things. And I was just like, wait, what? What? <laughs> I'm thrown for a loop there. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I know. I don't know. It's it's difficult to do a lot of things. I mean, measure for measure is always difficult oh. to do because there is that sexual assault situation happening, and yeah, and you you, I'm. It's part of the story. You gotta mm-hmm. you gotta kind of do it. I mean, oh, this there was one I read where <laughs> some director was defending the production by yeah. saying that. Well, I understand it makes people uncomfortable, but, but, you know, maybe that's a good thing because I don't think theater should always make you comfortable. So we'll just go ahead and do this. I'm like, no, no, no. There's a difference between Stanley Kowalski finally get having his way with Blanche Dubois because that's that's the natural progression of that show yeah. rather than, 
we're putting a character in blackface uh, in a theater in Harlem. Uh, there's a difference. <laughs> that that uncomfortableness is scripted in Streetcar Named Desire. The other we is, grow as people, and we should grow as a society. Yes, what once was once doesn't mean that it has to be now. You know, yeah. and just because it happened and it existed, definitely does not mean that that should happen now. It just don't understand sometimes the different uncomfortable people. Well, mm -hmm. anyway, that's the Fantastics. Any final thoughts on that? I'm I'm bummed I never saw it. I didn't live in the city in 2002, but I don't think I've ever been in an area that's actually had it. Well, actually, that Aaron Carter one you were talking about? Yeah. Closed in New York in 2017. In 2017? I think that's what I saw when I looked it up just now. Let me see. Really? Yep. I'm going to turn on my light. Hold on. It's getting dark in here. Oh, wait. No, no, no. 2011. I'm sorry. 2011. 2011. I moved here. I moved here in 2011. Pop singer Aaron Carter, who joined the off-Broadway cast of the Fantastics as Matt in November 2011, departs a long-running musical February 17th. So it was running through at least 2012. Well, then I take my life back. I mean, I, I don't take my life back. <laughs> it's all been a sham. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I have been around um, that entire time that it was here in New York. I just didn't go to see it. No, no. My bad. I would be interested to know what your reaction would have been. Like the first few songs, you're like, gosh, this is really sweet. And actually the opening number is really charming. Uh, yeah. and, you know, Try to remember that kind of September. That's where it's from. That's where that song is from. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> it's just blowing I've your mind that song before. Wow. <laughs> well, Yep. My knowledge that's is great it. today, isn't it? <laughs> I'm learning. That's El so Guy's opening tune. Yep. yep. That's crazy. I, I still would have been interested to see your reaction, like three songs in, you know, like you're discussing abductions. <laughs> I mean, I get the word and the Shakespearean, you know, the, the history of the word didn't always technically mean what it means now. I do get right. that. Yep. And I understand that. But, you know, be, being a nanny, one of my first things going into a show, I would have thought that this show was a kid show, a kid-ish show. Like mm -hmm. you are allowed to bring a 10 year old into the show. So a lot of times when I know that about a show, I immediately go in like, well, my kid's like this. And if I would have taken them to that show, I would have left, yeah. no doubt. And maybe yeah. that's just me being an old grump, but. I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I yeah. think there is a thing where we as just people yeah. have been through those traumas yeah. and just want to protect people from reliving that kind of stuff. I think it's important for them to learn things. Definitely mm -hmm. think it's important for them to learn things, you know, yep. um, before they saw six and, you know, all those other things I'm like explaining, you know, this is what that happened, you know, and it's like, that's important. They're older now, but right. they had such a cult fandom around that show. And so it's wild to think, the things that were in it, I guess. I don't know. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I know. I remember seeing it. I saw it once. Yeah. And when the character came out with the feather coming out the back of the head, I went, Oh, uh? that would have been my face when that uh? happened. I literally would have been... <laughs> Obviously I'm a very expressive person. Everyone would have known that I was like, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. And I tried so hard because I'm like, I just want to enjoy theater. I want to enjoy theater. And so for the rest of the show, I'm like, this is still kind of a cute and charming story. But then there were those two things. Ugh. It's so interesting. It's hard to preserve. It's hard to preserve. Yeah. yeah. I know when Aaron Carter was in it, it got even bigger, you know. And I'm sure. I'm sure. Even, even bigger. <laughs> but no, it did. It did. Mm -hmm. He apparently, he was great in it too, apparently. I do remember that. Fantastic. <laughs> there, I just made a pun. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey friends, this is your host, Aaron Odom, coming at you again. I want to thank you for listening to today's episode. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us a review wherever you pick this podcast up. Or go ahead and like, share, subscribe, all the cool stuff you do with podcasts. We are Trident Theater. That's T-H-E-A-T-R-E. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at our website, www.tridenttheater.com. Once again, this is Aaron Odom, and we try to get a new episode out every two weeks, so hope to see you again in a fortnight.